Well, hello, hello. Uh, Pastor Matt here. Just wanted to get on to this Facebook Live video. Unfortunately, last Sunday, our recording camera cut out uh, after 12 minutes, and so I wanted to come on and, uh, and share our sermon from Sunday, go through the notes. Our, our sermon on Sunday was titled, Your Grace is Enough. And uh, there's a, a lot that's been going on in a lot of people's lives. And so I wanted to uh, encourage, bring a word of encouragement, a word of reminder, and a word of, uh, yeah, of excitement um, to press in to God's grace, uh, regardless of the trials, the struggles, the, uh, the challenges uh, that we are experiencing internal and external affairs that are pressing and adding stress onto our lives. I wanted to remind you today of the grace of God. And we're going to be looking at a couple different uh, sections of Paul's writings. We're going to be in Ephesians. We're going to uh, touch on Romans and Corinthians. We'll even speak about a verse found in Hebrews this morning as we look into what it means to experience the grace of God in our lives. Um, and grace is often found in a place of despair. When we are in despair, when we're in trials, when we're in sufferings, is when we most need recognize and receive that grace. First, I want to start off with a couple definitions of mercy and grace. These are things that we see that throughout all of the Bible, that God continues to lay out mercy and grace towards people. And mercy is defined as not receiving what you deserve. So if you've done something incorrect, not receiving the consequence of that would be mercy. For if you are a parent and you have children um, and you've come to the realization that children do things that you ask them not to do, you can extend mercy towards your kids. I'm not going to give you a punishment or a discipline or something, even though you, you are entitled to one right now. And so mercy is not receiving what you do deserve. We're gonna look that, at that in the context of, Roman, of the book of Romans. Grace, on the other hand, is receiving something that you don't deserve. And so uh, let's go back to parenting. If, for example, uh, kids can act crazy, and at the end of the day, you still say, you know what, we're still gonna go to Dairy Queen. Even though you don't, you don't deserve this treat, you haven't acted in a way that makes me think, yes, I wanna give you ice cream right now, we're gonna go do it. And we're gonna, we're gonna extend some grace to the way that things have uh, been happening, and we're gonna go and enjoy this time. Um, and so I wanted to just acknowledge those two things. Mercy is not receiving what we do deserve, and as we look at the book of Romans and what Paul says, Paul says that all of us are deserving of God's wrath because all of us have fallen short of God's standard, of his glory. But God is rich in mercy and he doesn't give us what we deserve. Instead, he gave us Christ Jesus that we could experience forgiveness and reconciliation. And that is the grace. We then receive what we don't deserve through Jesus. I want to read with you today Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, because it speaks of the saving grace of God. Listen to Paul's words to the letter in, to the church in Ephesus. He says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, what a great conjunction that Paul writes here in Ephesians. He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love for which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ Jesus. By grace you have been saved. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him, that being Jesus, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. It is not a result of works that one may boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This, Paul speaks about a grace that saves, a grace that is not earned, a grace that you and I cannot walk around and say, I've done enough good deeds, I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've been diligent in enough good things that I deserve to be saved. Paul says that's not true. You have been saved by grace. This is a gift from God. That is something that has been given to you without you being deserving of it. And it is important to remember that because it, when you think you are entitled to a gift, you kind of downplay the value of what that gift is. But when we recognize that we are not entitled to this gift of grace, but that God being rich in mercy has lavished it, has placed it upon us, what what an incredible experience that is to realize and say, hey, I am not worthy of this. And yet for some reason you have loved me and you have given me grace that saves. Grace that affects and changes my life. That is why um, Paul says that it is a gift. It is undeserved. It is not something you're entitled to. It is because God wanted to give you grace, because God has grace to share um, abundantly. We have to recognize, friends, that, that God has an abundance of grace, and we actually have the opportunity to experience and borrow that grace, that grace for ourselves um, when we're in the pits of, uh, of going through an internal affair, right? the grace for others as we're in the, as we're in conflict within relationship. God, would you just give me some grace that I might see this person as you see them? God, would you give me some grace so that I can be um, gentle with myself as you are gentle and corrective with me? God's grace is a gift to us. Paul also wrote about God's grace in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and he's writing in an interesting context in 2 Corinthians. Paul says that he's had a thorn in his side uh, for a number of, for, a, for a quite a long time. And he says that this thorn, he identifies it as a messenger of Satan. Now, we don't know if this was a physical ailment, a, um, a physical condi condition, if it was a person that was uh, harassing, abusing, um, op oppressing Paul, um, if this was, we don't know what the te technical concept of this thorn in Paul's side was, but we do know that it ailed him for an, a, a while. He called it a messenger of Satan, and he says in 2 Corinthians that he prayed to God three times to remove this thorn from his flesh. And, uh, and Paul was a rather well-known missionary, and he was close to God. And in his prayer time, saying, God, would you remove this thorn from my flesh? God answered, no. My grace is sufficient for you in all circumstances. My strength, God said, is made perfect in your weakness. Grace is birthed in trial and pain. It is when we experience God's grace. And what I find so fascinating about Scripture is that God never says he's going to take away the trials. He says he will give you grace to go through them because his strength is made perfect in our weaknesses, because his strength is sufficient. It is enough for any situation we find ourselves in. This is a grace that gives strength. Not only does it save us, it says you don't have to work for it now, Within caution, once we've experienced grace, there is a response we have, which is works, and we'll talk about that in a few short minutes here. 
but this is a grace that saves, that is, uh, that is um, something we can be grateful for, but the grace also strengthens us. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, talks about this grace and how God said, my grace is sufficient. Paul, in writing to the Philippians in chapter 4, says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. And the context in which Paul was writing this was in jail, and as someone who said, whether I am well fed and able to be generous, or I am hungry, whether I am well clothed or cold and needing of clothes, whether I am enjoying my present life or uh, dealing with sufferings, whether I am feeling comfortable or feeling in deep need, he says, I have learned to be content in all situations because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And Paul likens that strength to the experience of God's grace in his life. I don't know the things that are going on in your life, but you do, and God does. And I want to encourage you that God is actually offering you sufficient grace to do all things and learn to be content with his grace rather than focused on your situation. It is a costly grace, but it is a grace that strengthens. It's costly in that it's birthed from trials, but it strengthens us to be able to walk through those trials. As Psalm 23 says, though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff, they comfort and they guide me. We see that God is not removing the trials. He is giving us the strength, his grace to move through them. His grace brings strength to our lives. This is a grace that grows and deepens um, as we encounter Jesus. It's internally applied. I want to, Hebrews 13, chap, uh, chapter 13, verse 9, says something very interesting that I want to just flip to here. I flipped past it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, it says, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be um, strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. There is something interesting that the writer of Hebrews says, that the strength of your heart comes from being strengthened by grace. Now, I don't think that the writer of Hebrews is saying, so go and eat all the junk food in the world because it's not gonna have an effect. I do think that there's value in eating healthy and uh, living active, healthy lives. But the writer of Hebrews says, don't rely upon that. I'll rely upon your heart being strengthened by the grace of God, growing deeper and stronger as you experience God's grace. Because when, we, when our hearts are protected and shielded by the grace of God, there's a lot of things that can come at us that no longer hold an effect because our hearts are strong. Our hearts are strong, we, we become content in who God's created us to be and what his purpose is for us. But most importantly, we become content knowing who we are in God. As Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, this grace comes not by our works that none of us can boast. None of us can stand before God and say, I did so much greatness and my heart was strengthened by my own goodness. No, our hearts are strengthened by the grace of God and that grace propels us to do good things. Friend, I want to ask you and challenge you have you had an opportunity to have your heart strengthened by God? Or have you been trying to strengthen your heart by every wind of self-care and self-help that's blown your direction? Again, I don't think it's inappropriate to eat well, to exercise, to, to do these things. But if that's where your heart finds strength, you will inevitably, inevitably fall. We need our hearts strengthened by the Lord Almighty. This is internally applied, but it's outwardly conveyed. 
It's empowering our hands and our actions as made evident by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That when the strength of God's grace has touched our hearts, it affects the way we live towards others. Because now when someone comes at you with a fiery dart of, of, of um, whatever it is, their words, their actions, all of a sudden our expression back to them is from a place of grace, strengthened, strong, content in who God is and who we are in God. And all of a sudden our responsiveness to others comes from a place of an inwardly applied grace that has been strengthened through Jesus. It is incredible how this grace gives us purpose in life. Flipping back to Ephesians chapter 2, it's, Paul writes, he says that you have been saved by grace, and this is not your own doing. It's a gift from God, not a result of works that we can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, this grace isn't earned by good works, but it purposes us for good works. And that's an important distinction to meet or to understand, friends, that it's not by works that we experience grace, it's for works that we experience grace. So much of the Christian faith, although internally applied, is meant for outwardly conveyance towards those around us, to demonstrate and be an example as to who Jesus is to others. It's not because of our works we experience grace, but it's by God's grace that we desire to do good works. And what are these good works? Well, Paul actually says, they are good works in which God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. What that tells me, friends, is that God has prepared good works for you to do. And he is giving you the grace to save you from legalism, needing to work it out for yourself. And he's in strengthening you with that grace to do those works. And he's given you purpose in that grace that you should do them. You have a choice to make. God, I recognize your grace, which saves me. I recognize your grace, which strengthens me and the good works that you're calling me to. And now I get to make the choice. Do I pursue you in that? Or do I reject it and go my own way? And this, friends, is the pivotal, mo pivotal moment. What do we do with the grace that God lays upon us, lavishes upon us, as Paul writes in Ephesians? Do we respond, recognizing that God has purposed us to look beyond our own needs and faults and to begin to share that grace with others? Do we surrender and submit our lives to Jesus that we might not only experience his grace, but be, uh, be conveyors of his grace to others? that we would not only accept his grace, but that we would then go and do what his grace empowers us to do through the Holy Spirit. You and I have a choice to make, friends, to submit and pursue Jesus in all facets of life, or to say no. Paul challenges, he says, God has given you purpose that you should do them. I believe that this grace that saves, that strengthens, that purposes is the type of grace that changes lives because of Jesus. It's the type of grace that in changes families because of the movement to the Holy Spirit. It's a type of grace that affects cities as we begin to remove judgments and insecurities and act in love and grace as God has called us to. Not working for that grace, but working because of that grace, out of, out of a place of grace for others. I believe it is a type of grace that affects nations. As God says countlessly throughout his word that we uh, that we are to go and disciple, make disciples of nations. Jesus says he will be with us to the ends of the ages. Be encouraged, church. I don't know what trials, struggles, tribulations, valleys of internal and external um, affairs that you are walking through today, but Jesus has promised that he will be with you and that his grace is there to save, strengthen, and purpose you. And so I just want to bless you today to receive and experience the divine grace that God has for you.
If you are in a time and a moment where you need to borrow and lean upon that grace, do so. Because God is rich in his mercy and great in his desire to share that grace with you. Church, I want to just uh, pr pray over you today um, as we close this sermon. And so thank you, God, for each one, Lord, who is listening to the words here, who is studying the scriptures, who is exp uh, exploring and encountering you, God. God, I just want to pray for them and ask, Lord, that you would uh, grant them uh, divine opportunities even in these coming days and weeks to experience your grace, to experience the removal of the burdens that they are carrying, and to experience your warmth and your grace, Lord God, as you purpose them, strengthen them, and reveal their salvation to them. I just want to thank you for these things, God, in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, church, so much for joining uh, today. It was great to be with you, and we will see you next week. God bless.